Hey everyone, welcome back to AFTV. Welcome back to the Tactical Insight Show. I am back with Graham and I'm really happy that I'm back to do this with you because it's another big win. It's a third big win on the bounce and um, it's only right that we discuss the goals, the set pieces, where this leaves Arsenal going into this weekend as well. There's a lot to talk about. Before I ask you how you are, Graham, and you know what you've been up to the last week and all that, just to let you guys know, we are filming this remotely. Obviously, AFTV are out in Nigeria at the moment doing some amazing content. Go check that all out if you want to see kind of what they've been doing in Nigeria, what it's like watching an Arsenal game out there with all those amazing fans, super passionate. I know Robbie's been having an amazing time out there with Ty and the gang as well. Um, and it's been, I, I've got to say, it's been really incredible kind of seeing their journey out there. Um, so go check that out. But it does mean that we are a little lighter than normal. So we are doing this from home. Um, but that's not going to take away from anything really, you know, in terms of breaking down what a massive win this was. It wasn't a perfect performance, but a massive win. Graham, how are you? You know, I'm very well, mate. Um, yeah, look, I was gutted to miss the two games. Chelsea, Man United, wasn't I? Uh, away working, unfortunately. Uh, away in Bournemouth for the last week um, at my union's annual conference. Um, I know a lot of people put in the comments section, where is he? And all that. And I apologise to all those people. Uh, and I was gutted to miss the two uh, performances against... Uh, obviously, I watched the games, but not to be able to come on and break it down with you. I thought you did an excellent job last week Thank breaking you. down the Chelsea and Man United games, by the way. I really enjoyed watching that. Uh, and I was just hoping I wasn't going to come back and jinx it this week because the last three I'd done with you, we'd lost all three. So I, I would not have seen this happening, to be honest, uh, that uh, we would then win the next three uh, and score nine goals in the process. Because when we did our last one, of course, I was wondering where the goals were coming from. But full credit to Mikel Arteta and the team. They've stepped up. And it's uh, yesterday, obviously, a nervy sort of game. But we got the job done. It's all about getting the results at this business end of the season, isn't it? And I'm really looking forward to coming back today and breaking the, the game down with you. Completely agree. Let's go straight into it. And, um, you know, sometimes on these shows, we like to discuss the context beforehand. It's always important. Now, for me, I had a sneaky feeling West Ham would go quite strong for this. And the reason is, unlike Leicester, who totally rotated for Spurs, you know, what's the big difference for Leicester if they finish 11th or 14th or 12th? I mean, yes, it matters. And yes, you want to finish as high as you can. But ultimately, there's not a a very clear European football's here or this is there or wherever. Now, West Ham are on the tails of Manchester United with, you know, the opportunity to seal Europa League football for next season. And I think, I think David Moyes would have looked at this game and thought, you know, they, they were unfortunate not to get a point at the bridge having rotated. They lost to Frankfurt 2-1 at home. I think he'd have thought he doesn't want to come out of this season with nothing, you know, no, no Champions League because they didn't win it, no silverware, and then no European football. I mean, maybe the Conference League. So I, I wasn't surprised he went as strong as he did. Were you, were you surprised? I know a lot of us. No, were. no, I wasn't. I, I wasn't surprised either, mate. For the, for the reasons that you said, they've still got a great chance of finishing in the top six. Yeah, uh, and they are on the fringes of the European places, so they were never going to rotate in the way that a lot of fans thought they would. Um, and I think that he was. Very pragmatic, the way he went about it, uh, rotating one or two players. Uh, but I think he was always going to go fairly strong in this game. Uh, obviously, he wasn't helped by injuries at centre-back. And that Dawson yeah. sending off last week was massive for him. And he had to play Cresswell, a left-back in the middle, and move Fredericks a right-back to left-back, which I think obviously helped us in the game. But overall, no, I wasn't surprised at all. No, absolutely. And yeah, there were injuries and players missing. But look, we could say the same for Arsenal. You know, Tommy Asu only just back. Tierney party unavailable. We know the strike situation. So, um, yeah, both teams not at their absolute best. And I think that was reflected in the first half. Second half, it, you know, it looked a little bit more tactically... Um, I don't know, on purpose, I suppose, is, is the word... Uh, deliberate is the word I'm going for. Let's look at the match stats. Um, I don't know. I mean, what do you take from these, Graham? Uh, look, I, I think the, the we had 13 shots there, eight, seven on target there, three. I, I thought that, as me and you were discussing off air before we started today, I thought we carried more of a threat. They they looked the more proactive, and certainly they started the game. I thought the game started very sluggishly, actually, James, but both teams sort of sit in. We sat very deep first half, weren't pressing as well as we normally do. Uh, but I thought, although they had more passes and had more possession, and they certainly thought they had more, um, they were more progressive with their passing in the first half. And we did score against a run of play. I thought we had the better chances, James. I don't know if you agree on that. 
I, yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. I, I, I thought we did. In fact, let me just bring them back up and just go through. I mean, 13 shots to their eight, seven on target to their three. They had 13% more possession with 56 to 43. Uh, they had almost 100, oh, oh, sorry, over 100 more passes than us in the game. But we, we registered a higher XG. I, I, I think it was one of those games where because we weren't playing scintillating stuff, I think we felt very nervous and felt like, we never really had control of it. But actually, when you look back, and I was listening to a few neutrals, I love going on YouTube and hearing other YouTubers who don't have a dog in the fight sort of discussing the game. And they said it was a very impressive performance from us. And I thought, really? Uh, I, I didn't get that. But in hindsight, when you look at not necessarily the chances, but some of the openings we carved, especially in that second half, you know, in terms of getting in Ketty a 1-1 with, Zuma, some of the shots he had at goal that actually maybe in hindsight he'd probably be thinking he should have scored maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, you know, from I set think, pieces, we looked dangerous, yeah. we, we asked yeah. questions. I think it was but, a solid away performance. Yeah, I, I think the thing I liked about the team was we weren't playing well, but we managed the game even though we weren't playing well. I think that's credit to the players because I don't think the passing was as crisp and as assured as it normally did. Obviously, losing Benjamin White to a, a tight uh, hamstring before the game and I know Holding came in and did really well his defending was superb and he scored but I think what you've got to remember is uh, uh, Benjamin White and Thomas Partey are like almost like our two key passers from deep and Absolutely. we lost both those so we lost a bit of the passing ability that the team has through those two players not being available I thought that you are right second half when they were pushing more players forward to try and get an equaliser Gaps did open up in behind, and, and yeah. that's one thing that Ketia can do. He's a threat in behind. So we did have greater chances. Did force Fabianzi into more saves. I can't remember Ramsdale making many saves in the game, one from a Rice header. Yeah. Uh, but I thought we weren't great in the game, but we managed the game, and we defended solidly as a unit. Yeah, I, comple I, I completely agree. And actually, on the topic of set pieces, which is obviously that was the deciding factor in the game, you know, how we dealt with them from one end to the other. Um, let's go into, because you really wanted to talk about the Nicholas Yerva effect. And as you as you go into it, let me just throw out some interesting stats. These come from The Analyst. Go check them out at theanalyst.com. They've got some really, a really interesting uh, metric section where they kind of break down XG and goals and you, you see kind of where you stand in the league. So only the top three boast a better XG for set pieces against than Arsenal with only Wolves, Chelsea and Man City conceding less goals than the Gunners from set pieces. And we move on to this next one again via the analyst. Only Southampton, Man City and Liverpool have scored more goals from set pieces this season. The Gunners have also faced the fourth fewest shots this season from set pieces with 98. Um, he arrived in the summer. We lost, I forgot his name. He came from Brentford. And then can't Lenny. remember it either. <laughs> I want to say, I can't remember. No. I, I, I'm, yeah. But, oh, Andreas Georgeson. There we go. Yeah, so well, he, he came from Brentford in Arteta's first summer, then left last year, I think, took another job. And, and we brought in Nicholas Yova, came from Man City. And Man City ranks super highly when it comes to set pieces, you know, and all the metrics. So, yeah, a, a very shrewd acquisition and one that doesn't go down on deadline day is one of the signings of the season. But, a crucial, crucial, you know, employment. Indeed. I think in a, in a game like this, set pieces were always going to be really important. And um, the fact that we took advantage of two of them uh, and scored our two goals, the fact that we defended really well from them, obviously in the end was pivotal in the way the game played out in the 2-1 win. I think he has done a, a really excellent job. I don't think we've conceded a goal from a corner, directly from a corner since he's come in a set Not piece. Not directly, coach. no. No, and I, th I think that also, I think the club, uh, when we knew that uh, Dawson wasn't going to be available, they have got a bit of a centre-half crisis. I know Zuma's come back, but they were without, uh, they're always going to uh, only play one centre-half this week. Uh, Declan Rice was talked about as possibly having to uh, go back to perform those sort of duties. I think he's such a pivotal part of their team in centre-mid that they didn't want to take that chance. So they would have probably have thought, you know what, we're going to work on set plays, particularly in the way we sort of like block players, screen players yeah. from set pieces, and the way we're going to arrive late in the box, our movement in the box, knowing that they're probably not going to have height in the box. And I think there was a lot of talk afterwards about West Ham suffer through lack of height in the box. And I'm pretty sure that the Yova and Arteta would have targeted this area. And it certainly looked like it, the way we scored our opening goal, didn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, we were going to touch on Arsenal's shape, but while we're on the topic of set pieces, let's look at that first goal, because I really wanted to break it down here on the tactical pad. Where is it? Here it is. Now, um, what I find really interesting about this goal, if we just make the players a little bit smaller, you you made a point, Graham, when we were talking about this goal and uh, and where the blocks were and where the, the, the blockers were and where the runners were. Um, and I think you can see them here in Granite Xhaka and Eddie Nketiah almost starting as a kind of nearer Fabianski, but they move out into the area where, where the ball ends up. On the other side, you've got Holding and Gabriel who end up attacking the space. Now, what's really interesting about West Ham's shape is they've almost got two lines where you can see, in fact, if we just show it, you've got sort of for now, you've got Rice, you've got Zuma, you've got Creswell, you've got Sufal. Actually, let me just really animate it here so you can all see. We'll do it in yellow. You know, they've got their sort of box of five players or their line of five players all there. And that's their that's their big guys. You know, Frederick's there as well. Those are their best headers of the ball. So clearly they're there to act as, you know, the players to clear. And then we'll highlight in white, Noble, Lanzini and Bowen are actually man-marking, holding Gabriel and Tavares, who all stand at six foot plus. I think the design here from West Ham was to basically get Noble, Lanzini, Bowen to block runners or, or make, make the run uncomfortable, make sure they don't have the run. And then the five that we've mentioned here in that yellow box to basically clear the lines. But a few players do a key role here. You've got Granit Xhaka. But let's clear and show it. You've got um, in yellow, you've got Granit Xhaka. You've got Eddie Nketiah. But then you've got Tommy Asu as well, who doesn't actually run into the space to attack the ball as well. He goes to almost make it uncomfortable for Lanzini and Bowen, make sure they don't have a direct run. They can't track holding and Gabriel as easily. And then the rest is history. We'll play the goal through. And watch Tommy Asu. The ball comes in from Saka. Tommy Asu goes the other way and holding's there to nod it into the back of the net. We'll play it again at half speed. Goes into the box from Saka. Holding's got the run. He does well to shove Lanzini off as well, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And then... It's a really good header. What, what yeah, did two, you make of that goal? Yeah, I think the two points I took out of it uh, were, well, three points actually. One, a really good delivery from Saka from the, from the corner, right into the six-yard box. The way our players get the blocks in and the screens in to stop their bigger players getting out because their bigger players are key. And the way that Holding makes his run, times his run, sheds off Lanzini really nicely to get across him and get the header in. It was a, a really well-worked corner. Uh, and, you know, a well-worked tactic. And I think that's what I think Nicholas Yoba has brought to the team. Because, you know, in the past, I can't ever remember seeing us score from corners, the amount that we're scoring now. Um, oh, no. Rob Holding's first goal, it was talked about afterwards, I know, on yesterday, Rob Holding's first goal in the Premier League in his 81st appearance, and what a time to get it. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree. And and he was, I thought he did really, really well stepping in. You sent in some stats. Talk Talk us through him. Well, I just think he was uh, probably not so great in possession, but I think everything you want in a team sitting deep, defending. When he's come in this year, Rob Holding, he's defended really well when we've gone to a back five, but he's, he stepped up here in a back four. Not only with blocks, uh, if you look at the numbers there, um, he won 100% of his duels, um, aerial duels as well, 100%. Uh, one possession five times, three key blocks, a key block in the first half when it was at nil-nil two great tackles and a headed goal, uh, 78 touches. Overall, really good stats um, and a, a really good performance. I thought he was my man of the match, James. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think was fantastic. Definitely shout for man of the match. I know Sky Sports gave him man of the match. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll just add while we're on it, the, the partnership with Gabriel yesterday, and I know we're going to talk about yeah. Gabriel in the second goal. As a centre-back partnership yesterday, holding Gabriel between them, 11 clearances, four blocks, four tackles, one interception and two goals. They've got both our goals. So uh, a, a brilliant centre-back uh, partnership yesterday. And I thought Gabriel, give him a shout-out as well. I thought in the game, he's passing out from the back. And obviously, Ben White is normally the player who we go to for the sort of like the, the pass into midfield. I thought Gabriel stepped up yesterday as one of our better passers on the day. Yeah, see, that's interesting. I, I know you're, you're specifically mentioning passes there. I didn't think Gabriel had a very good game at all. I think after his goal, he settled. Um, but I thought he looked a little all over the place. Um, maybe not necessarily in possession. I thought 
I thought, again, Arsenal lost the ball a lot in sloppy areas, but more in kind of counter-attacking opportunities. Actually, when Arsenal were looking just to knock the ball around the back and retain a bit of possession, I thought we looked quite crisp and quite good. And that is something that has just become a... And, and a thing we expect under Arteta now, that the, the, the team retained possession well. Um, it was more when the counter-attacking opportunities were there and, and the game opened up that I felt we were looking really sloppy and we weren't getting that pass right. But yeah, on the topic of Gabriel, you know, again, gets his goal, um, you know, and, and did brilliantly to get that. And how many times has he stepped up now, you know, in set-piece situations to get us goals? I mean, that's a real asset for us. Uh, but Holding was the better of the two. Um, and I thought he stepped in and did really, really well, actually. I thought he dealt with his one-on-one duels, his recoveries, his, his won his headers. I mean, I thought he was fantastic. And when they did bring on the big guys, Yarmolenko, Antonio and Suchek, they still did nothing. A couple of balls went into the box and Arsenal dealt with them really well. So, um, yeah, massive credit to Rob Holding. I thought he was, I thought he was terrific. Um, let's talk about, I know you wanted to talk about Arsenal's shape. Now, we normally do this early in the show before we go on to discuss everything else. But um, on the topic of Nicolas Yova, you know, he did a great job and, and, you know, we get two goals from set pieces. But Arsenal's shape was interesting because Tommy Asu came straight back in, which I think was a little bit of a surprise. I thought it was a bit touch and go 50-50 whether he would. Um, and you felt that had an impact on the way we used Tavares. Yeah, I did. I, I thought that Tommy Asu coming back in, first of all, I'll give him enormous credit. I thought that when you watched him in that game, you... As, as good as Cedric's been, and you immediately saw the difference. Uh, he literally shut down that right-hand side. He got immediately got into it, won a couple of headers straight away, shut Ben Rama down a couple of occasions when he tried to run in behind. And I thought that his role really uh, was to be almost like inverted, uh, along with Holding and Gabriel. And I thought the key tactic that we were looking to use in that game with Jacka sitting on any in a two in, as, a, as a pivot was to get Nuno up high. Nuno was obviously, uh, I think, had a big role to play in this game. Unfortunately, it didn't quite come off. And I thought our left-hand side just didn't work at all, particularly in the first half. Um, I thought that uh, I, was, I was surprised that uh, with Nuno in the team, uh, Smith Rowe and him are probably the better combination than Martinelli and Nuno. I think we missed Tierney on that side, obviously. But Nuno, to be fair to him, has come in the last couple of games and done okay. But he just wasn't at it yesterday. One of those, and that's the inconsistency you get with a young player. I thought the um, when we attacked on that left hand side, um, I thought Martinelli was coming inside. He was uh, going out, up high, but the, not really sort of like connecting with Martinelli at all. I thought the distances between them were too great, um, out of possession. Yeah, uh, and I just I just didn't think that left side worked at all, James. In the first half, it was uh, his passing was sloppy, Nuno, and I just didn't think he he made any sort of decent forays forward like he did do in the, in the Man United game, and he went back to one of those sort of chaotic performances that he's capable of having, you know. So I yeah. didn't think the left hand side worked, you know. Uh, Jacker was filling no, in on the left hand side. Jacker was filling on the left hand side when he was going high, of course. Martinelli was playing very narrow, and I just didn't think the combination worked. Um, and I, I just agree. Think, I just think attacking-wise, with Odegaard sitting more deeper in this game, uh, looking to look after Declan Rice a bit more, I thought we needed that left side to be working better than it did. Uh, and, and, and we had problems there in the game, not only going forward, but out of possession. And that's what led to West Ham's equaliser with uh, Nuno very narrow when Declan Rice brings the ball out to Kufal uh, on the right-hand side. He's got plenty of space to get across in. So, yeah, for me, I didn't think the left-hand side worked at all with Nuno and Martinelli both individually having very poor performances. Yeah, I agree. I thought I thought Nuno Tavares was a lot better in the second half um, because the game opened up a little bit and you did see one or two kind of marauding runs. And I think Arsenal then became a little bit more compact and a little bit more organised at the back, which I think is a good sign that as the game goes on, Arsenal are finding a a rhythm and an ability to get organised. Normally you start organised and as the game goes on, you get pulled apart or tired or whatever. Arsenal, I think the last couple of games against United as well, against Chelsea, the second half was better than the first half. Arsenal found an ability to tighten up as the game goes on um, and I thought Tavares' second half was better to be fair to him but um, yeah I mean with Tommy Asu coming back I agree with you the shape was always going to involve 
Saka being high and wide on the right, Tavares being high and wide on the left. And it brings up this whole, you know, then who's better for that position? I think Martinelli is more likely to do what he did yesterday, which is whip the ball to the back post. You know, great ball out of nothing. He wasn't having a good game. And essentially play a huge part in winning you the match. Smith Rowe, you almost feel maybe doesn't have that natural moment out of nothing. But he can, when he's firing, he scores goals and he links up and he, he comes into those central areas better than Martinelli. So, yeah, I mean, good problems to have, I think. But um, it is interesting kind of how it kind yeah. of looks tactically. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point you make, actually, that about Martinelli. Uh, he wasn't having a poor game, but he's, in that moment, he played the right pass, the right cross. Yeah. And that's a good point you make because maybe Smith Rowe doesn't make that cross. I just thought the partnership in the first half just wasn't great. I agree with your second half, Nuno, slightly better. Um, but it's it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I think feel as though, you know, uh, when Smith Rose played with Nuno, um, Smith Rose seems to be better inside, and 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 Nuno seems to then have more license to sort of understand when he's going to go forward. I think in this game, uh, for whatever reason, I just didn't think the the combination between them worked. But I think it could well have been also the fact the team weren't playing really well. Uh, it, it was a, a case, uh, you know, we're saying that that combination wasn't working. We didn't make the most of our left-hand side. I thought Granny Jacko, you know, you quite rightly said he had a brilliant second half. But even in the first half, one or two sloppy passes from Granny Jacko. I thought El Nenny was a bit more conservative in this game in the first half, although he was very clean with his passing and had a good game, I thought. I just didn't think the team clicked on the day. And so maybe when we're looking at that left-sided issue, it was just systematic uh, of the way that the team were struggling to play the sort of football they're capable of. Um, and said that, it was such a, a big game. Uh, and at the business end of the season, it's all about results. Uh, and in the end, we got the job done. But, you know, we're just highlighting the, the problems on that left-hand side. Um, and again, it, it boils down to the fact that, you know, uh, they are young players. They're going to be inconsistent. And Nuno has done really well for us the last two games. So I'm not, you know, in any way trying to um, disrespect him at all. He just had a... A difficult game yesterday, and I just didn't think that side worked. But I didn't think the team, as I say, I didn't think the team were really great yesterday. But we just stuck at it and uh, and still found a way to win, which is credit to Arteta and the team. Yeah, completely agree. Let's talk about Eddie and Um, Got his numbers here. I mean, not a bad set of stats, is it? Um, no, I thought he came alive in the second half. Um, what do you make of his performance? I thought he was really threatening all game. I think in the first half, it was Eddie's run and shot that Fabianski carried away that led to the corner to the first goal. I thought he dropped into midfield really cleverly to, to overload the midfield when he had to. I thought he was always putting Zuma under pressure, even though Zuma's a bigger guy. And he was a threat in behind. He offers something that obviously that Lacazette can't offer, and that is that pace in behind. So when you're away from home and you're needing an outlet, you're needing... Somebody who can stretch a defence, running behind. You've got a Niketia who offers something that obviously Lacazette can't offer. So I thought he, he deserved the goal yesterday. And I, I, I think the last two performances he's put in, even though he got the goals at Chelsea, he hasn't scored in these two games. These performances have been worth goals. And I think he's really sort of like playing really well for the team. And it sort of bids the question at the moment, where are we going to go with him at the end of the season? Because obviously uh, his contract's up for renewal, isn't it? And um, I, I think he's... You know, you know, making a case for a new contract almost, and he's he's played well the last few games, and and I think he's a threat, and uh, I like the way he's, his energy, his personality, and the fact that he's always looking to get a shot away. He, he takes responsibility. I thought he had a really good game yesterday, and he stretched West Ham, and as you see there, he's first in all those numbers. Yeah, I I, I thought he grew into the game even more. Uh, what's gone under the radar is his hold up play. He's actually holding yeah. up the ball really well, um, a lot better than I thought he had in him. And he's doing it against, you know, defenders like, you know, Varane, Lindelof, Thiago Silva, um, Zuma, you know, good players, you know, and, and he's and he's not phased really by it. I, I thought he won us a few fouls. I thought he showed a maturity to his game. And the fact that he can come short and then swivel and go in beyond, I, I, I nearly, if I'd had the time, you know, with so much to cover, I'd like to have almost redrawn that El Nenny pass in that Nketiah run because not only is a phenomenal pass and he does well to get a shot away, it's the dart in and then the turn and out, which is really good movement. And you only do that when you back yourself with serious pace. And he got a few shots at goal. And I think if there's one, one slight criticism 
of Inketi's performances, I think I think he would feel he should have scored one of those chances. I think when you look at them back, I think the angle was there and he never quite found that you know the real side netting that he was going for. Um, but he asked questions earlier, Fabianski, and he always got shots away and credit to him. I, I thought he had a really good performance. I completely agree. Um, anything else to add on Inketi or do we start talking about Aaron Ramsdale? Because there is some stuff to say on him. <laughs> no, well, first of all, just finishing off on Eddie, I think he forced Fabianski into two very good saves. Um, before that, that, that run he had when he got in onto his right foot, he had plenty of the goal to aim at and it just narrowly missed. That's the sort of chance I want him to be tucking away. If he put that goal in, then that that would have capped off a perfect performance. So I agree with you. It, it was a great performance. Uh, I just think he might have taken one of those chances. That's the only criticism you can add of him. But yeah. but I, I'll tell you one thing about Eddie. He's only what twenty three, James. I think he is. Isn't he? You know, he's know that, he's got yeah. he's never short of confidence, and he's not. Sh- uh, one thing we criticise Lacquer for over the season is not wanting to take a shot. This lad is not frightened of taking a shot and he's always willing to take responsibility in good areas and I like to see that. And, and I think he had a really fine performance yesterday and was probably, my, for me, just behind Rob Holding as our best player. I, I agree. Now, on Aaron Ramsdale, this is what I'll say. <laughs> I thought he was, by one moment, which we'll touch on, I thought he was actually back to his best. I thought he made a really good save from Rice. I thought his distribution was really good. Um, I thought he commanded his area. And I, I think generally, and I say generally, he got through the game just doing his thing as he'd been doing in the first half of the season. And we got almost first half of the season Ramsdale back for for 99.9% of the game. But there was a moment. Now, I did a whole monologue on full time yesterday after the game on how... I don't think you necessarily need to catch a player or con- make contact with a player for it to be a foul. Now, that's not how the game's refereed, but it's just my belief. I, I think if you have to jump out of the way of, and, and, and ride a challenge that a player's got nowhere near the ball, you know, that is a foul, whether you've managed to get out of the way or not. You know, you're almost penalised for protecting yourself. Um, I think Ramsdale got away with one. What do you think? Yeah, I thought it was very reckless. Uh, challenge by him to be fair um and he was lucky no doubt about it um you know to go out sort of like straight leg studs up is a dangerous sort of tackle uh, to make um credit for Bowen uh, for trying to because let's face it Bowen could have easily have gone into he gone into him uh, and and then the referee would have had a decision to make whether it was yellow card red card and I, I must admit looking at the pitch yesterday I couldn't tell if we the fact that he was going wide, I think he would have got away with not being a red card. But it was certainly coming back to the challenge. Certainly, I would say if that was against one of our players, we would be screaming at it saying that was reckless. So, you know, I, I thought I agree with you. He had a really good performance yesterday back to the old Aaron Ramsdale. But he's almost got this one sort of moment in him, isn't he? He's almost like, I'm not going to say he's a granite jacker of goalkeepers, but, but, you know, to come out and make that challenge um, and the way he did um, was... For me, reckless, and I, I'll be honest about it. Um, and um, I think Bowen was luck- unlucky to get a yellow card. Uh, he was quite honest about it and said, that, you know, he didn't touch me. Uh, and he told, you know, if you listen to Aaron's interview after the game, he said Bowen immediately was honest and said to the ref, it wasn't a foul, he didn't touch me, and credit Bowen for that. I think, uh, you know, David Moyes was going on about it, uh, about and, and very much along the same lines as what you're thinking. You know, it doesn't have to be a that to be a... a, a technically a foul uh, and, and you know but there was no contact at the end of the day so uh you know but you know I, I look upon it it was it was a big moment in the games James it, it was 1-1 yeah. at that time had it gone wrong he could have easily been sent off and then we don't get the win so you know as much as I love Aaron Ramsdale we all love Aaron Ramsdale I think you know he's got and we love the fact that he's he's, he's quicker out of his goal than say Leno ever used to be um, and that's one of the things they like about him. But lately, one or two decisions he's been making have been a bit rash. Uh, and so this is where, uh, sorry, sorry to cut you, you know, yeah. because you know, I agree. I, I, I think, I think with Ramsdale, there's a lot I love about him. Um, but there are certain things that I wish he just did a little bit more subtly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, I just question whether he actually needed to be out that far because when you think about it, Bowen's, I mean. 
Bowen's that's still about stuff. 10 or 12 yeah. yards outside, the, about 30 odd yards from goal, isn't it? It's not as if he's coming up to the penalty box or anything. You know, he's a long way out of his goal and he's going wide. The ball is out wide on, the, mm. wide on their right-hand side. It's not, no, by no means clear cut, he's going to get a clear running on goal. So he, he makes that decision to sweep up, obviously, to come. And he's once he's made that decision, he's got to get there. But it's just the challenge, isn't it? The way he goes about the challenge is dangerous. You know, it, you know, it yeah. could, if he if he got into Bowen's leg, it could easily have been a leg breaker, couldn't it? Because he was studs up high. Let's go into the closing stats. Um, so by beating West Ham, Arsenal have achieved European football next season and have at least qualified for the Europa League. Now, I'm not for one second saying there's anything to celebrate, but for a team that a lot of people weren't expecting to get top six, four games to go, Europa League football sealed, that puts to bed all the fears that we only had just two weeks ago about Arsenal looking like a side who might not even get, you know, sixth, might end up seventh or eighth. So that's a that's a positive, it's a bonus. It is. I never. I mean, if you'd said to me uh, after the Southampton result uh, that we'd win our next three and book Europa League qualification by beating Chelsea, Man United and West Ham, I would have laughed at you. I'll be honest with you. But we've done it, haven't we? And I think that it is important. Whatever you say, it is important we've achieved European qualification because I think that was the goal this season, at least yeah. to achieve uh, uh, European qualification. And we've achieved that. And that gives, gives us a chance now to look at going at one bit better than achieving Champions League. But that was the goal, James, and we've done it. Yeah, I, be I believe it was. I agree. Arsenal now scored 98 goals versus West Ham in the Premier League. Only against Everton with 112 have they scored more in the competition. Arsenal now won the third most games in the Premier League with 20. Only City on 26. Liverpool on 25 have won more. I really like that. And, and listen... It's not to say Arsenal have been better than Chelsea this season. Absolutely not. But I look in the season at dropped points and West Ham, have, sorry, Chelsea have dropped points in more games than Arsenal. And um, we know Chelsea are a better side and we know that we've got some work to do till we get to that level. But for where the teams were to have won more Premier League games than Chelsea this season, um, you know, 34 games gone. And I do yeah. think that will change in these coming games, though. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think it's impressive. So well done. Um, James. Yeah, go I just come in there and say we've also yeah. overtaken Chelsea, uh, second on the list for most Premier League wins of all time now. Man United, 702 oh. wins. Chelsea was 616. We've now gone up to 617. So not only have we won more games than them in the Premier League this season, we've now overtaken them in Premier League history with more games, uh, more wins. So a uh, significant uh, milestone there. And yes, I know there's still games to go this season. They could easily readdress that. But, um, you know, two great stats there. The fact that we... Yeah. And particularly the first one you read out there, because that is a really good stat that we've that we've actually won third most games in the Premier League this season. That, and when you think that we lost our first three games as well. Mm, I know, I know. What a turnaround. Keep it going, Arsenal. Yeah. Arsenal have now won seven of their last nine away games in the Premier League. I really like that stat. That's a big one. Gabriel has now scored seven goals for Arsenal in all competitions, with seven coming from corner situations. Rob Rob Holding scored his first Premier League goal for Arsenal in his 81st appearance, and Holding stepping up in the absence of Ben White. Um, yeah, did really really well. So fair play to him there. Um, we're going to round off just a quick word from you on this weekend. It's a big one. Um, they're all big, but I think this is big because Tottenham would have looked at this weekend just gone, Leicester at home, Arsenal going to West Ham as their opportunity to gain points. But we was we put in a bit of a statement win, not necessarily performance, bit of a statement win. We said no, that's three on the bounce now. We're we're here to stay. We've got Leeds at home and they've got Liverpool away. And, and listen, Liverpool away is different to West Ham away. But similarly, the now roles reverse. So we're thinking we got the opportunity to do our job at home, and hopefully they'll drop points. If things go the way we hope and expect them to go, we could be four or five points clear going to the North London derby. Now. I will never, ever write off Spurs. I think they're a superb counter-attacking side. I think they've got the weapon weapons you need to hurt this Liverpool team. I also think Leeds will be fighting for their lives. But that said, it's a big weekend. It is a big weekend. And uh, so many different twists and turns over the last few weeks, James. It's, it does feel like this could be a massive weekend. If we could beat Leeds and they were to lose to... Uh, Liverpool, that would be five points with only three games to go, of which the next fixture would be the North London derby. So even if they were to beat us, they'd still be two points 
behind us. But the pressure really would be on them then to absolutely win that game, wouldn't it? Yeah. If they if they're five games, if they're five points behind us going into that game, they know they've got to win it. Uh, and and it's almost like um, table pressure as well as sort of pressure of trying to win the game. So I think as much as everyone's talking about the North London derby being the key game, I think almost this next week is key. It's absolutely vital that we beat Leeds. And a Leeds team yeah. that battled hard for long periods against Matter City on Saturday night, I watched that game, uh, and have been rejuvenated since uh, uh, had their new manager, admittedly. Uh, but we have got a game at home against Leeds that really on paper we should win. And I know, you know, it's funny about talking about football's not played on paper, I know. But if we could beat Leeds and they get turned over by Liverpool, five points, I think mentally for them, with three games left, puts them in a position where they are under so much pressure going into that North London derby. And we could easily secure uh, Champions League football at White Hart Lane. It's possible, isn't it? It's not as good as winning the league at White Hart Lane. And we've won that uh, twice in my lifetime, but um, which equals the amount of times they've won it in their history and not at White Hart Lane winning the, I'm talking about winning the title. But it would be fantastic for this bunch of players if we could sort of like get the result against Leeds, go into that game against uh, Tottenham and secure uh, Champions League football at White Hart Lane. But, Let's get the you know, one game at a time. I mean, I'm talking about footballers now. One game at a time. Let's win the next one against Leeds. But it does feel to me the next week, James, will be pivotal in this Premier League season for the Champions League fourth sports spot. Agreed. Guys, we'll be there to cover it all. Don't forget to check out all the content coming out on AFTV this week. Uh, I believe we've got some supporters clubs coming, so you'll be delighted to see they're coming back, everyone. Um, don't forget all the any news. We'll be reacting to it. And check out the content from Nigeria as well. The AFTV tour has been amazing. And if you haven't seen what's been going on out there so far, go check it out. Um, Graham, a big thank you for joining me, mate. No, a pleasure as always. And uh, look, looking forward to getting back in the studio next week for the two games. Leeds are on, on the Monday when we review that one. And then, obviously, Tottenham, I'll be there on the Friday. I've got to review that, that one with you. I you know, wouldn't want to miss that for the world. So, yeah, uh, looking forward to that. And, look, it's been, a, a, as always, a pleasure doing these shows with you, mate. And, uh, you know, enjoyed the content you did last week while I was away. I was watching it thinking, what a great breakdown you did of those two games. And uh, I do miss it when I don't do it. So, love being back with you. And uh, thanks, as always, to the many no, kind thanks, comments. Mate. The many kind comments in the in the comments from people who watched the show last week. It's, yeah, you know, I'm so glad that people enjoy it and uh, means a lot to me doing it with you, mate. So, yeah, look forward to rounding off the season with you. And let's go next week against Leeds and get that result. Appreciate it, mate. Well, I, I can speak for everyone, so it, it's always better when you're here. So, amazing. But, guys, <laughs> big thank you. Um, smash a like on this video if you did enjoy it. And, um, you know, any suggestions for things you'd like to see for next season? We are starting to think about all that now. So, Get in your suggestions. We read every comment. We see what you guys are saying. Speak to us on social media as well um, and let us know. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and we'll see you very soon. Thanks again. Shop for AFTV merch at shop.aftv.co.uk. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat and Twitch. We've got content for every platform. So check it out.